Hello, inmates, and welcome back to the Cell Block Scorch. This is Styx, and I'll be recording as the winner of Scorch 226B. Octo gave the prompt last week, which was, with a name that pretentious, you'd think they'd be a little more impressive. Before I read this, I just want you guys to know that I had completely forgotten everything that happened in this Scorch, much like Octo. <laughs> Octo mentioned last week that she didn't know what was going to happen in this Scorch. Well, neither did I. But when I read it, <laughs> I was at work and I actually <laughs> started laughing at my own ridiculousness. And when I explained the situation to my coworker, he was like, oh, so it's pretty good then? And I was like, well, I don't know if it's good, but it's funny to me. My target audience was myself, and man, did I deliver. So, with that glowing introduction, you are sure to be disappointed. I should have managed your expectations in the other direction. In fact, retroactively, I am going to manage your expectations in that direction. You should not expect this to be funny at all, because I'm not funny. With that, <laughs> the title of the piece is Jonathan and Mots. The sign over the door says Jonathan and Mots. It's about 60% bookstore, 20% coffee shop, and 10% aquarium. The last 10% is Labyrinth, because Mott sometimes leaves boxes of new books open on the floor for weeks before he shelves them, because Jonathan sometimes puts up a clothesline between the bookshelves for his homemade drip candles, and because their clientele likes to make themselves comfortable with their books and their coffee on the floor by the fish tanks. It's Friday at precisely 10 p.m. when a woman bursts through the doors in a wind-whipped fury. Priscilla! She shouts shrilly. A grad student in faded overalls jumps and spills coffee all over her open book. She leaps up in a kind of wild-eyed panic, blowing hysterically on the wet pages, while the woman in the door blinks rapidly, properly taking in her surroundings. Mrs. Havers says a boy in a small group of teens. They're all clustered around a game of chess at the cafe. Is something wrong? The woman, Mrs. Havers, presumably, whirls on him. Eli Porter, she growls. What have you done with my daughter? Eli exchanges a confused look with the others at the table. They're a rough-looking crowd. Kids with dyed hair and shaved sides, cheap piercings and worn jeans and patched jackets. They slouch over the arms and backs of their chairs and brush muffin crumbs off their clothing while they shrug. What do you mean, ma'am? Eli asks. Mrs. Havers sputters. I know she's here, she says. I tracked her phone when she snuck out. She whips out her own phone and waves it around as proof. Eli looks at her like he's about to make a generational joke about women in her demographic, but reins himself in at the last second. You tracked her phone, he says instead. The sheer disappointment in his voice could cow a charging bull. Mrs. Havers hesitates, but blusters uncertainly onward. What is this place? A drug shop? And an adult pornography? She trails off as an elderly woman wanders out from between the shelves and casts her a withering look. A drug shop? One of the teenagers repeats under their breath, and the whole group titters amongst themselves. Priscilla! shouts Mrs. Havers, clearly unnerved. But she came here on a mission, and she intends to see it through. People are reading here, you know, calls someone from behind one of the bookshelves. Stand down, River Deer, interrupts a warm, friendly voice. They 
all turned to watch a short, squat man waddle out from among the bookshelves with a fresh pile of bestsellers. Some of the teenagers stand up to help him unload the stack on top of an Amazon box full of fish food. Welcome to Jonathan and Mott's, the man tells Mrs. Havers pleasantly. Priscilla is in the back helping with the pastry dough. Jonathan and Mott's, Mrs. Havers repeats, furrowing her brow. The man laughs. It is an odd name, he admits. Those are our nicknames for each other. He crosses the room to the cafe and waves her into a chair by the counter. Mrs. Havers obeys in a sort of daze. Jonathan, she asks, wrangling the concepts of Jonathan and nickname into some sort of agreement. Only to me? The man says, circling around the counter with a friendly wink. I must insist you call him Jonathaniel. Mrs. Havers opens her mouth and closes it, deciding, for perhaps the first time in her life, that it's better not to ask. Coffee? asks the man. Mrs. Havers nods. So you must be... If the other owner's name is Jonathaniel, she can only imagine what Mott could possibly be. Timothy, the man says, interrupting her train of thought. Ah. Without another word, she trades him her credit card for the coffee that he slides under her nose. On the house, says Timothy dismissively, in honor of Priscilla's pastries. She has quite a knack for them, if you didn't know. It is clear to everyone watching that Mrs. Havers did not know. You drink up. I'll check in with my darling Jonathan and see how long it'll be back there, Timothy says. He smiles as he dusts off his hands and disappears through a service door. The teenagers have returned to their game of chess. Timothy comes back with a dot of flour on his nose and a rosy blush in his cheeks. Five more minutes, he says. Mrs. Havers carefully clears her throat. <clears> throat. What do you do here? She asks. Timothy shrugs cheerfully. It changes from month to month. Jonathan's always starting up a new side hustle. Some days he barely has time for his own coffee, let alone the cafe. That can't be good for business, Miss Havers says severely. Oh, posh, Timothy says. Arthur Reginald handles the business. Jonathan and I just do what we like. So far, it seems like other people like it. He waves out at the eclectic collection of customers in the shop, and the ones that can see him wave back. Mrs. Havers looks confused, but slightly relieved that someone else is taking care of their finances. Finally, a hulking pillar of a man ducks his head under the doorway, carrying a steaming plate of cookies into the room. Behind him, a slip of a girl peeks carefully out at her mother. Um, squeaks the girl. Hi. The man silently distributes the cookies amongst the seated customers. Thanks, Jonathaniel, says Eli, eagerly accepting his chair. A small chorus rings out over the shop. You're the man, Jonathaniel, and Jonathaniel, I could kiss you, and let's go, Jonathaniel. Not the fish, Jonathan, Timothy cries suddenly. You know it's bad for them. Jonathaniel pauses. But they look so hungry, he says. They're perfectly well fed. Timothy assures him. Jonathaniel sighs. He returns to Timothy and leans down, down, down to kiss the top of his head. If you say so, Mott. They smile at each other with sickening fondness. Mrs. Havers looks over at her daughter, who shuffles her feet by the entrance to the kitchen. This is where you go on Fridays? she asks incredulously. Priscilla nods. To bake? 
get baked whole, murmurs one of the teens, and Eli swats her head and hisses, You're not helping! Mrs. Havers shakes her head incredulously. If that's all you were doing, why did you sneak out? Priscilla bites her lip. You wouldn't have let me come. Immediately, Mrs. Havers is suspicious again. And why's that? Mom, my curfew is at ten, Priscilla says desperately. Yes, Mrs. Havers confirms. So you wouldn't have let me come, Priscilla insists. What? Huh. Mrs. Havers sputters. I don't see why you can't come here at regular hours. I'm too busy, Priscilla says, with track and clubs and homework and everything. This is the only time I can come. Mrs. Havers thinks about that and sighs. Let's talk about this more at home. Jonathaniel put some snacks into a small paper bag and hands it to Priscilla to take home. They gather their things and head out. About halfway to the door, Priscilla makes a distressed sound and throws her arm up, stopping her mother in her tracks. You almost killed him! she cries. Mrs. Havers looks down at her feet. An enormous black cat is stretched out on the floor, so big that she'd taken it for a rug. Ah, excuse me. Ah, yes, Timothy says from behind the counter. The third partner in our company, Arthur Reginald. The cat slides out of the way on its belly, using his feet as paddles. With a name that pretentious, you'd think they'd be a little more impressive. Mrs. Havers grumbles, frowning. Everyone in the entire shop gasps theatrically. With considerable effort, the cat rolls over and swats at its nose. Arthur Reginald, Priscilla hisses fiercely, is our pride and joy. Apologize, Eli demands. Mrs. Havers sighs. Let's just go. Priscilla huffs and guides her mother by the arm out the door. Arthur Reginald mews, and the whole shop agrees wholeheartedly. Deeply unpleasant woman. Exceptionally rude. How does Priscilla manage? <laughs> Karen. There's a moment of silence before Eli says, Do you think she'll let her come back? She will. Jonathaniel assures him. And if she doesn't, Timothy adds brightly, we'll take matters into our own hands. Everyone sighs, satisfied with the answer. Eli returns to the chess game. The grad student returns to her book. The elderly woman returns to the shelves. Jonathan and Mott join hands, smiling out at the little paradise they've built. Hey friends, this is Octo coming at you with judge comments again. Um, I'm going to be honest, the reason that this scorched one over the other two, because they were all really good this week, even though Red sent me a meme, essentially, is that I would, I would literally die for Jonathaniel, okay? I would. I adore him. I think he is an adorable giant man, and I want him to be happy, and so I had to choose him. I also like the way that um, that sticks messed around with the name stuff because we got some weird nicknames like Mott and Jonathan, which is actually a nickname for Jonathaniel, which is itself a very strange name. But then it turns out that the cat is the thing that has a fancy name and everyone was ready to die for this cat. And you know what? That's fair. This giant fat black cat needs love also. Um, Red... You know what she did? She just sent me a picture of Voldemort with Tom Marvolo Riddle underneath it, which is objectively funny, but could not be this out. And, um, Bones did this really fun little, like, 
post-canon piece in one of their universes that I'm sure you will get to know with this uh, cool guy named Rishon, who I love dearly, and has a very impressive name, but not a very impressive anything else. Um, yeah, the just, this piece is so nice, it has such good vibes, like, we have this little coffee shop, and everyone is so happy in it, and they're just chilling, it's just like a nice place for teenagers to go. It's very calming, a good atmosphere, and so that's why it won. I just really liked it. And that's all from me. Um, keep that fire burning. All right. I hope you liked it. This Scorch was actually based on a running joke that we had at the time. I'm going to try and tell you the story and just know that my memory is absolute nonsense. And so I'm going to tell you what I think happened based half on memory and half on knowledge of us as a friend group. And I'm going to leave it to Bones to editorialize if I'm completely wrong about everything. So basically, we're all writers, hence the, uh, the writing competition that we have since made into a podcast. And we were discussing one day fantasy names and strategies for making names, and mishmashing different normal names together to get weird names, and we ended up with Jonathaniel, which was a really funny name to us. I don't know if you guys feel the same about the name Jonathaniel, but once we had hit upon the name Jonathaniel, we couldn't let it go. Or I couldn't, at least. Maybe I'm projecting. Maybe it's a me thing. But it was funny to us, collectively, not just me, that you could have someone who used Jonathan as a nickname. And then, of course, from there, once we got this beautiful Scorch prompt about names, and pretentious names specifically, I was like, Well, this is a fantastic opportunity to make all my friends laugh with this cool name that we created. Of course, the obvious foil to a completely normal nickname for a completely bonkers full name would be a completely bonkers nickname for a completely normal name. And so I was like, okay... Jonathan and Timothy. <laughs> Jonathaniel and Mott. We just weirdified them in opposite directions, right? And it was fun. And I think Octo probably also found it funny because she picked me. And of course, there's the added benefit of having super cute, eccentric, gay couple at the center of this. And a a heartwarming, hopefully, hopefully heartwarming, moment of understanding between a mother and child. Anyway, I had a lot of fun writing this piece, and I hope you had a lot of fun listening to it. The prompt that I gave for the next week is, relax, I know a guy. I don't really remember what pieces came in for that one, but I'm sure they will be a delight. So stay tuned in. Keep those fires burning, everybody, and you will hear from me again very soon. The Cellblock Scorch is a production of Stellacor, an independent group of nerds sharing their obsessions with the world. We can be reached at thestellacor at gmail.com through comments on your podcast platform of choice, our Instagram, Stella underscore core, and at our YouTube, also called Stellacor. Feel free to check out our other productions on our YouTube channel, or our cosplays on Instagram. If you would like to support our creative endeavors, you can give a one-time tip to the ko-fi of the writer of your favorite Scorches, or check out our Patreon, linked in the show notes. There, you can access the winning Scorches and episode transcripts for free, or sign up for Spark Level support for $5 a month to gain access to all of the Scorch submissions.